Palm for uh, inviting me. And um, hello to everybody. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk about uh, MetaWave Inframetry on the Atom chip um, with special emphasis on the Stern-Gerlach uh, apparatus and how uh, this kind of um, uh, inframetry may also touch on issues that relate to gravity. Um, so uh, let me see if my pointer here works. I hope you can see my pointer. So, um, well, what we see here are some pictures. You'll, uh, you'll see these pictures again, and I'll explain to them. Uh, but in principle, what you see here is a picture of an atom chip. Uh, I'll briefly um, explain to those who don't know what the atom chip is, although it's been around almost now for 20 years. Uh, this is how an interference pattern looks like. It's an interference pattern of atoms, not of light, but it looks like the interference pattern of a double slit experiment. We're very close to the surface, so we have to take care of all kinds of decoherence uh, effects from the surface. And of course, this is the Stengerch apparatus, which is the base for what I am going to show today. And we have quite a bit of uh, entanglement be between spin and motion in the Stengerch apparatus. So, so I will also uh, mention uh, this uh, a, a little bit. Uh, let's see, for some reason, I'm not able to... Um, I'll change my slide. Oh, here it is. Okay, so um, hundred years ago, we all know that we had the Stengerlach uh, experiment, and actually uh, a year ago, there was a very nice uh, uh, conference or workshop uh, uh, celebrating a hundred years since uh, Stern and Gerlach went into the lab. Uh, they went into the lab right here where the arrow is pointing right here in this building. This building is still standing. And in the same complex of buildings, we did the uh, uh, nice uh, celebration uh, last year. And so it was really nice um, to deliver a talk about Sterngerch inframetry uh, in the same building where the experiment started uh, 100 uh, years ago. Here I bring some um, anecdotes uh, that people uh, perhaps don't know. Uh, one of them is that Otto uh, Stern escaped in 1933 from Germany. Eventually, he died and is buried in Berkeley. And um, uh, one of his good friends was Eliza Meitner. And uh, an interesting anecdote about her, uh, she worked, by the way, in the Fritz Haber Institute um, in Berlin. Uh, one of the interesting anecdotes about her that she was nominated 48 times for the Nobel, she never received it. Until now, historians are trying to understand why. Okay, we all know the story about Otto Stern. He loved cigars, and the story goes that his cigar, actually the smoke from his cigar, um, had some reaction with the silver atoms, and that's what gave him eventually the signal, observable signal. Um, anyway, they had a very interesting and uh, a complex apparatuses uh, there. Now you might think, think that uh, the Stengerch apparatus is simple, at least the textbooks that we study from in undergraduate studies say that they're simple, but you could see that very smart people still wrote in the 80s papers about the Stengerch apparatus. So I hope that by the end of the talk, at least you will be convinced that the Stengerch apparatus is not as simple as people uh, think. By the way, the papers did not stop coming in the 80s, uh, papers are still coming out about different effects that have to do with the Stengerlach apparatus. So on one hand, it's an ancient paradigm of quantum mechanics, but on the other hand, people feel, uh, still find surprises. For example, just a few days ago, uh, I found this paper on the archive. Um, and um, what you see here are these people claiming that some interpretation of the Eisenberg uncertainty principle, which is represented here by this green line, is uh, violated by the Stengerlach uh, apparatus. Uh, and there, uh, some of these new papers that are coming out, I will mention uh, as we go uh, along. Can I ask a question? Do you mind? Already a question, yes. I just wonder if, you, if there's a formal definition of what a Stengerlach experiment is. Well, I would say that it has to do with uh, the, the original uh, definition. Of course, there are many spin uh, related forces, uh, even light that people do in lattices. 
but uh, I would, uh, I, in this talk at least, I refer to the original idea of using um, um, magnetic gradients, static magnetic gradients uh, uh, to apply forces on spins. So that is how I define for this talk, the Stern Gerlach uh, uh, apparatus. Okay, I hope that answered the question. Um, Thank you. So the outline, uh, well, before I tell you about the outline, uh, a few pictures uh, from the desert around my university. My university is the youngest university in Israel, Ben Gurion University. It's about an hour uh, south of uh, Tel Aviv. You can take a convenient train from the airport if you come and visit. And it's desert, but it's beautiful desert. So of course, you know, the camels are all around and a lot of wildlife manages to survive in the desert on all kinds of water holes. And uh, from time to time, I take my students into the canyons. The water carves beautiful canyons in the, um, in the desert. And uh, I always joke that uh, this is what my students have to be if they want to finish a, po a, a PhD with me. They have to go through at least one of these uh, uh, quite hard hikes. And sometimes I go flying in the desert. You see here an ultralight. And uh, I take sometimes my students. And I always say uh, it's factual, uh, uh, it's 100% correct. I always say that no one has ever, in the 30 years that I take students up into the air or friends, no one has ever asked for a second flight. I don't know really why, but that's, that's the fact. OK, so the outline is, um, first of all, a quick reminder of what the atom chip is, then what is Tengelchen interferometry? Uh, this is very different than what Stern Gerloff did 100 years ago. And then we'll move to clock interferometry that is based on uh, Stern Gerloff interferometry. And uh, this already brings in gravity and redshift. Then, very briefly, a spin off that actually surprised us. And that is that if you do clock interferometry, you also encounter geometrical phase. I'll very briefly mention that. And then I'll give quite an extended outlook. Uh, which also connects uh, to uh, the issue of quantum uh, gravity. So that's the outline for today. Now, isolated atoms are used on uh, a wide range of, um, of topics in physics. So I tried to give a color code of some of the things that um, um, isolated atoms are used for. Uh, you have in red, you know, things that have to do with uh, traditionally with high energy physics. Um, you have things that have to do with cosmology uh, in blue, uh, things that have to do with uh, uh, short range forces or surfaces in green, uh, many body physics you can have here in purple, you see here in purple and everything that has to do with technology like clocks or quantum computing or sensors, uh, which is also called second quantum revolution these days is in yellow. Um, we'll not talk about today about quantum technology, but just to let you know that we're also fascinated by quantum technology. And here I just bring very quickly uh, a scan of the project in our group. Uh, one example is a very uh, uh, compact uh, microwave clock. You see here a pyramid moth. This is a real picture. Uh, one of the clouds is the uh, correct or real cloud and the other ones are just reflections. You see here the the pyramid moth and the cloud of cold atoms, only one fiber is going into this apparatus and does everything. It does the uh, cooling and the optical pumping and the interrogation, uh, everything is done by this one fiber that is going into this uh, thing. Here you see a handheld, it's the size of a palm of a hand. There are atoms here, there's a vapor cell here, fiber going in, fiber going out. And it's uh, without any metals or electronics, this is a magnetic sensor that you can make arrays of from here, NV diamond centers are imaging without a scan, a lattice of, uh, um, a lattice of uh, vortices in a superconductor. So we just put a, a thin layer of uh, magnetic sensors and a thin layer of diamond with NV centers on a superconductor. And we can image, could, could image this with a CCD. Hopefully this will give new insights to high TC superconductivity. And here you see a European consortium uh, that we are a part of that is trying to use now optical clocks. Uh, we're building an iterbium optical clock, atomic optical clock. So this is a consortium of groups in Europe 
that are trying to make them robust enough, the atomic optical clocks, in order for the second, definition of the second, to move from microwave clocks to uh, optical frequency clocks. So this is just a very fast scan of the kind of um, quantum technology we're doing in our lab. Now, the vision behind uh, the atom chip uh, is really uh, to try and imitate uh, previous revolutions. We know that about 40, 50 years ago, we moved from these kinds of electronic boards to integrated uh, chips. Uh, uh, maybe 20 years ago, we moved from these kind of optical uh, uh, tabletop uh, experiments to these kind of uh, photonic chips. And these kind of matter wave experiments, cold matter wave experiments, or cold atom experiments, uh, I think this is a picture actually of the clock in, at NIST, um, where you have a, a room full of lasers and vacuum and electronics and whatnot. The, the vision 20 years ago that started in three groups, uh, actually uh, in Harvard, in Innsbruck, and in uh, Garching, uh, the vision was uh, to bring all of this room and to put it onto uh, a chip. And then you get the best of both worlds, a solid state device, but with very long coherence time because the atoms are not touching the surface. The surface is room temperature. The atoms are a few microns above the surface in vacuum, and they can maintain a temperature, a very low temperature uh, of the on the scale of a nano Kelvin. Okay, so this is an artist view of how an atom chip looks like. You see here the atoms, you can have one atom or a BC in a magnetic trap. Uh, and the magnetic trap is formed by currents that are running inside uh, wires. Uh, so this is a silicon surface with gold wires, um, current carrying gold wires above it. And this specific uh, uh, paper uh, uh, was written by Jakob Reichel, uh, who was working uh, at the time at Garching with uh, Ted Hench. Uh, and this actually uh, snake-like pattern was invented by Ted Hench uh, and it is able, it's conveyor belt that is able to move the atoms uh, from side uh, to side. Uh, so this is really, I like to say that uh, atom chips are where material engineering meet quantum optics because you have to really know both fields in order to be able to integrate them well. In the lab, this is how it looks like, a real picture where you see uh, uh, the, the wires and the electrodes. And you see here one image is the real image of the BC and the other image is just a reflection from the surface. And the distance, the very small distance between these two uh, clouds tells you how close you are. The atom chip uh, actually uh, is not a static project. It's, uh, the definition is uh, uh, broadening uh, uh, quickly and it's really beautiful to see how the field is exploding. So if we started with ground state atoms uh, 20 years ago, and uh, now you, you can find on atom chips, uh, Rydberg atoms, you can find cold molecules, you can find cold ions, cold electrons. And now in uh, the latest project, we're actually bringing an atom chip to CERN uh, because CERN is going down in uh, energy. It's very nice to see uh, for at least for uh, antimatter. And the idea is to use the atom chip to um, trap and manipulate uh, anti-hydrogen atoms. So that's a very nice project that we are now starting uh, together with uh, collaborators at CERN and in Europe. Uh, uh, here are a few examples of uh, chips we're making. We're not making chips in our fabrication facility only for our group, but for groups all over the world. Uh, this is a chip, for example, that in the lab of Ferdinand schmidt Color, where you see two ions trapped. Uh, uh, this is a chip that went to Amsterdam, Robert Spiro's group, uh, where you see a permanent magnet lattice where atoms are fluorescing from this lattice. This is a chip that went to the UK, uh, to Nottingham, where you see permanent magnets uh, making a Sanyak loop interferometer. Um, the idea really, the vision of this chip is that within the chip, this is a silicon wafer, the width here, the thickness is only 500 micron. Inside, there will be actually the vacuum. There will not be an external vacuum. You would be holding the chip and you would not know if it's a regular Pentium chip from Intel or you have cold atoms inside. And inside this tiny vacuum cell, you'd have everything. You'd have the getter pump and the particle source and maybe some MEMS to, uh, to have valves between bad vacuum and good vacuum and some integrated lasers. And you make some uh, magneto optical trap and then you, have, you read out the experiment with a cavity QD maybe. Uh, through electronics or through fibers. 
And this vision, which looks like science fiction, is already quite advanced in several groups around the world. And here I took a picture from Southampton, where they're really making a very nice effort in putting this together. And this is already an engineering model or engineering design of how to make this kind of uh, chip a reality. OK. Um, if you're really interested, then uh, this uh, we put this uh, review um, um, on the archive. You can find it uh, five years ago. It was 15 years on, for the atom chip, celebrating 15 years for the atom chip. And I think it has something like 400 references. It's really a detailed review if you're interested in where the atom chip is at least five years ago. Two atom chips made it into space. It's very nice to uh, um, note. Uh, one of them, uh, the DLR, the German Space Agency, um, uh, sent a rocket up uh, to space. Here you have a vacuum chamber with an atom chip. And uh, this was actually a very beautiful experiment uh, with uh, people like uh, Ernst Russell, Wolfgang Schleich, and others. Uh, and um, this experiment really made BCs all the way up and all the way down. So really beautiful microgravity experiment. Another uh, atom chip is now on the International Space Station. Uh, it's a JPL uh, uh, NASA project where they're doing all kinds of interferometry uh, experiments on this uh, atom chip. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the chip was uh, made by Cold Quanta, um, um, the company in Boulder, Colorado that makes atom chips. Uh, and of course, there are many companies uh, uh, already around. Uh, this is called Quanta that I just mentioned with a beautiful vacuum chamber. It's almost the size of your palm. Uh, a two chamber device, 2D mod plus uh, uh, a chamber with the chip. And uh, um, IonQ making uh, ion chips for quantum computing and other companies. And also companies that have not done uh, chips so far are now trying to go into the business of chips for, the, for example, this great from UPMs. So companies are definitely also going into the business of atom chips. It's nice to see. Uh, this is a chip we made for the um, US Air Force. And uh, I cannot give details, obviously, but it's a very interesting quantum technology chip. And this is the chip I was talking about that is going to uh, CERN um, um, and uh, into the antimatter factory of uh, anti-hydrogen uh, atoms. And this here, it's being tested in the lab of Ferdinand schmidt Keller in Mainz. OK, so uh, atom chips are all also going into the field of atomtronics. That means uh, circuits, arbitrary circuits uh, for atoms, like you would have for electrons. So instead of electronics, we call it atomtronics. For example, here you see uh, a loop, a potential guide for a Sanyak loop. But instead of having the usual thing where you put a BC every minute or so uh, into the loop and release it, trying to see the Sanyak effect, this is a CW, uh, a CW uh, a device with the tunneling barriers where all the time a stream of atoms, the, for example, from a 2D mod is going to go in through these tunneling barriers and uh, giving a continuous uh, signal from a Sanyak loop. So these circuits called atomtronics are now quite a promising uh, um, feature that uh, the atom chip uh, is the, uh, forms the base for. OK, the two unique properties of the atom chip we're going to use today in our talk uh, are, are one, a very high gradient that you can uh, get for the magnetic field, uh, even with a, a very moderate current. Uh, here I give a specific example. If you take just two amps through a straight wire and put the atoms 10 microns away from the wire, you get 40 kilograms per millimeter. Yeah, so these are very strong gradients and you can give, even go a few orders of magnitude above it if you use special wires. This is the typical current for a gold wire. Uh, in addition, because we don't have coils, there's very low inductance and we can switch on and off our magnetic fields in microseconds and even nanoseconds. This is something that you could not do before for such high gradients and high fields, okay? Now, if you turn, if you just take an atom, uh, which has a population in uh, the manifold of Zeeman sublevels, and you turn on a gradient like that, what you see immediately, here's the surface of the chip and the wire is here. And you see, uh, after some time of flight, all the different uh, populations uh, having a different location because they were accelerated by a different force, depending on their Zeeman sublevel uh, when we started, when we 
gave the current. So this is the effect we're actually going to use uh, in um, our talk today. Okay, so Sterngraf splitting is really essentially a, a beam splitter, like for optics, but it has a, a twist. And I just want to tell you that even this simple beam splitter or double slit experiment, uh, people uh, are still thinking about it uh, quite seriously. Uh, you know that Feynman said it contains the only mystery, the simple double slit experiment, but people are still writing a lot of stuff, interesting stuff about this double slit experiment. Of course, don't have time to go into it. Let me just mention that uh, in 2016, Aronov wrote an interesting paper about finally making sense of the double slit experiment. And I think it's not the last word. So there's still interesting thing in the double slit experiment, but the stern experiment brings the double slit experiment with a, sweep, with a twist. And the twist is of course that there is entanglement between the momentum and the spin. So there's another Hilbert space here that we are opening up uh, and we're creating entanglement between these two degrees uh, of freedom. Okay, by the way, just in passing, let me mention that last year, uh, we also started to work on stern gerlach not with neutral atoms, but with charged atoms, namely with ions. There are many theory papers claiming it cannot be done with electrons, but we came to the conclusion that with heavy ions, it could be done, done and there are advantages to also do it with charged particles. So this is an interesting paper for whoever deals with cold ions and wants to do the stern gerlach experiment. So if you just use the splitting uh, or the entanglement between the spin and the uh, motion, you still don't have an inferometer. You can do all kinds of interesting things with this entangling uh, operation. For example, here uh, is an idea that came to us from the group of Juan Pablo Paz in Argentina about how to turn this into a work meter. So uh, you have some work being done here uh, on the spin on the internal degrees of freedom of the atom, but you cannot measure directly because you collapse the energy and you cannot in this way know what was the real quantum work. But if you entangle it to an auxiliary qubit before the work was done and then entangle, entangle also after the work was done, then you can measure the auxiliary um, qubit or degree of freedom. And in one image actually can get the full uh, uh, answer of what work was done uh, on the um, on the system, and this is just to show you that even the the level of just splitting and entangling, the Stern Gerlach can do a lot. The Stern Gerlach half loop was really uh, what we call the half loop was really what was done a hundred years ago. So you all know this postcard that was sent from Frankfurt to uh, Niels Bohr in Denmark, in Copenhagen. Um, and the thing that I asked historians about, and they said that they think it didn't come up, was the question of whether or not the splitting was coherent. All the textbooks tell us that this was the state at the, in the Stern Gerlach apparatus, but there was no proof of that. Because we would get the same signal here of the two spots or the two lines on the screen, even if it was a statistical mixture, 50% up and 50% down. There was no way to know if it was a statistical mixture or, coher or a coherent superposition. The only way we know how to do that is by interferometry. And they didn't have, of course, the technology for that. So this is a question mark, which is something that the textbook did not tell us. And the question is, uh, so the first uh, challenge that we put uh, forward was to try and answer this uh, question mark uh, and to show that indeed uh, we could this could be a coherent splitting. And by, by the way, uh, Sugato mentioned it, there were many no-go theorems. Many theoreticians wrote papers saying it, it cannot be coherent, okay? And we set out to show that it can be coherent. And these are some of the arguments uh, that uh, were uh, given by people. It started even uh, as early as Eisenberg. Uh, um, he said that the uncertainty principle uh, tells us that if we uh, give enough force, this is this force, uh, for enough time to really split two wave packets, uh, we are bound by the uncertainty principle uh, not to have um, uh, a stable phase front that would enable uh, a coherent uh, superposition. Uh, um, uh, this paper just came out in uh, 2006 uh, says that it has to do with, uh, you cannot have it for a completely different reason, which is decoherence. 
coming from the macroscopic magnets that are coupled very strongly to the spin. And they suggested to do it with squids or at very low temperatures. And this guy from Los Alamos said, uh, went even further and said that Einstein relativity and the understanding of Schrodinger equation uh, forbid continuation of a spin superposition through the stein gela field. So there are all kinds of arguments uh, of why this cannot uh, happen. So this is how the, the half loop looks like. And uh, of course, you take one wave packet. In the old days, they thought about permanent magnets. So you have your permanent magnets giving you gradients. The first gradient splits uh, the spins, and then the second gradient uh, uh, stops the relative motion. And then you can think of uh, putting here a screen or something. And uh, uh, we were not the first to try it. Uh, there were previous uh, attempts. Uh, I call these actually heroic attempts because they really uh, we worked hard. Uh, this uh, French group worked for 10 or 15 years. Uh, they put here, as you can see, many uh, shields, a lot of shielding, uh, because they were afraid of the coupling uh, that is uh, very destructive to the different spins. And um, uh, they really did uh, um, very nice experiments. But uh, what I'm going to show you, they did not have the technology to see. And this is this beautiful spatial interference pattern that we uh, got. And the reason they, why they could not see it was because they still did the beam experiment. And our source was a BEC. So the experiment, the half loop in uh, our technology or in our language of the atom chip looks like this. You just take an internal state two, some Zeeman sublevel. You put a pi over two pulse with an RF radiation, with RF radiation, you get the superposition, internal superposition, you put a magnetic gradient by just running a current through the, a, a wire in the chip. Um, and then they split because of the different force on the two spins. Then uh, you, we put another pi over two uh, just to erase the which path information or to mix the spins, if you like, in popular language. Then we stop the relative motion with another uh, magnetic uh, pulse, magnetic gradient pulse. Now there is zero relative velocity. And now we just let them expand like in the double slit experiment. Once they expand, they overlap. Uh, and uh, we get these beautiful interference patterns that have something like 99% uh, visibility. Um, so uh, some people claimed that we actually see it not, we have not proven coherence in the experiment because we didn't do it single atom at a time, but it's some kind of coherence of the BC that we see. And to disprove this claim, we also did it with a thermal cloud above the BC threshold, and we still get a very nice uh, interference uh, pattern. So the starting point is about 100 micron under the chip. We're quite close. That's why we have um, strong gradients. By the way, people these days can go to one micron from the chip. Uh, so you can really get uh, uh, very high gradients uh, for future experiments. So this is actually uh, how we started. And we're still studying uh, this uh, configuration. It has a lot of surprises in it. And last year, we published another analysis uh, of this configuration. OK, so we have proven coherence as far as we uh, uh, think or believe. But now the game only begins. And the question is, what can we do with it? So the first thing we would like to uh, play with is which path information we all know uh, about the laws of complementarity and which path information. And we would like to see if there are any new games we can play. So the first thing that came to mind was an idea from Vienna, um, from the group of uh, Bruckner, Czeslav Bruckner. Um, and um, they came up with a really nice idea to uh, do clock interferometry, namely uh, take a single clock and split it in some way, and uh, then each, way, each clock wave packet of the same clock would go through another trajectory in this curved space time. And the, and the different wave packets of the same clock should uh, measure a different proper time if they have a different height above Earth. And then they said that a time should be a which path uh, witness. And if this is correct, the time should be a which path witness, then it should kill the visibility of the interference pattern because of complementarity rules. And they also uh, hinted that this is really testing the interface of quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity. 
because it requires both these theories to explain the experiment. Uh, one, you require quantum mechanics to explain the superposition state and the inframeter and the interference pattern. And two, you require general uh, relativity to explain the proper time that the different wave packets uh, see, okay? By the way, in our proof of principle um, experiment, we were not sensitive enough with our clocks to really feel redshift. Uh, the redshift of Earth, as, as you know, is pretty uh, small. Uh, so in this proof of principle experiment, we actually used what we call a synthetic redshift, which was some kind of uh, physical simulation that we managed to make uh, of the redshift. But we saw the same effect. So we're still working, as you see here, uh, on this uh, experiment. Um, uh, the last paper came out two years ago, uh, but we're now working on an upgraded experiment uh, where, for example, we're uh, going to um, close some of the loopholes that were in the previous um, uh, experiment that we did. For example, we're going to use uh, um, uh, states that are non-magnetic sensitive, so real clock states, a real microwave clock, and other improvements uh, in this um, uh, experiment. So to briefly explain, explain the experiment, um, let me just uh, uh, show you here. We take the half loop that you already saw before, but here, instead of just letting the wave packets expand and overlap, we create a block sphere in each one of the trajectories with another pi over two. So again, a superposition, so it's a clock actually. Now there's a clock in each one of the paths. And then we do the synthetic redshift I just talked about uh, with a very weak magnetic gradient that makes the upper clock and the lower clock tick at different rates, just like proper time should do. And then we look at the interference pattern and try to see the prediction that came out of Vienna as I told you before. Now the prediction was that if you look at the interference visibility, the visibility of this thing, and you change the relative redshift between the two uh, wave packets. So this, you might say that this axis here uh, is for example, the distance between the wave packets. So it uh, affects the uh, relative uh, redshift between them. If you change the relative redshift between the two wave packets, you should see oscillations of the visibility simply because sometimes the clocks, the clock hands show the same time but after another, uh, after half a circle, they, they're orthogonal and you have which path information, you would, got, you would get no interference pattern, no visibility. But then if it continues the, uh, the evolution, you would again be in the state of similar clocks in terms of the quantum state and you would again have no which path information and again get visibility. And that's exactly what we saw uh, in the experiment. Now this is, there are many twists here and I don't have time to go into it, but, um, let, let me just tell you that on the blocks here, each of these two uh, arrows represents a, a different clock. So if you have here green and red, these are the green and red clocks. It's the same clock again, but two wave packets of the same clock. So you can draw them on the same block sphere. And if you start really playing with these two clocks, uh, two clock wave packets on a block sphere, and you go to higher spins, uh, you find very strange uh, uh, effects you can find them in our papers. Um, uh, that we, we still don't know what they mean, uh, but it looks like there is some, um, uh, at least mathematically, because we have not done the experiment, this some kind of uh, uh, entanglement um, uh, uh, between uh, the parameters of quantum mechanics and the parameters of general relativity, uh, which we cannot break apart. So that's very interesting, and we will continue to follow up this strangeness that we saw the minute in the mathematics, the minute that we went to higher spins. Uh, and this is of course connected uh, to all kinds of works. For example, gravity induced decoherence. Again, there's uh, all kinds of witch path information that come up from that. This, is, this, this idea is again from the Bruckner group. And also it connects to all kinds of post quantum theories. Uh, for example, people hypothesize that when clocks really become sensitive uh, to redshift in an interferometer, then we would see a breaking of the complementarity relation, which you see here. Okay, uh, one last uh, uh, comment here is that uh, uh, there was a huge uh, debate uh, about uh, which interferometers are sensitive to proper time and which are not. Not all interferometers are sensitive to proper time. 
symmetric interferometers like the Kasevich two are not sensitive to, uh, to the difference in redshift. Uh, but the stern gerlach apparently uh, is, and luckily, is uh, not symmetric, and uh, therefore it is sensitive to a proper time differences. Uh, a very quick spin-off. I'll spend very uh, short amount, a very short amount of time on it. Is again these clocks. If you have these two clock wave packets that I showed you before, the difference between them, as you do the uh, uh, synthetic redshift or real redshift, you move one relative to the other along this latitude, because phi is really the coordinate which uh, redshift changes. Okay. So redshift changes the tick rate of the clock, sorry. Redshift changes the tick rate and the tick rate is just this phi, the evolution of phi. So when you move from uh, this wave packet to this wave packet, what you have really done is just apply a redshift. And this actually uh, doesn't close an area on the sphere, but it's already enough through something called the geodesic rule close an area, an effective area, and this brings about some, uh, a geometrical phase, which you observed. And uh, this just came out this year. And so this, uh, we call it an experimental test of the geodesic rule uh, proposition for the non-cyclic. It's not cyclic because we didn't complete the whole circle, but the geodesic line completes it for us. And so it's a non-cyclic geometric uh, phase. And just to let you know that there is a relation between what we call the dynamic phase and the pancharatnam phase, which uh, already dates back to 56, and what we call the uh, geometric uh, phase. It's all connected in quite a straightforward uh, connection. And uh, just to show you some nice result, this is prediction from 91. Um, and this is our prediction. Uh, it's exactly the same theoretical prediction. And it's beautiful to see the data sitting exactly on the theory, where the theory predicts here very sharp lines uh, in the geometric, very sharp jumps in the geometric phase uh, as you cross the equator with theta, uh, um, uh, which is actually uh, where your clock uh, sits. Uh, does it sit on the equator or it sits slightly above the equator or slightly below the equator? You get these very sharp jumps which we're now thinking about turning into some kind of sensor, maybe gravitational sensor. So um, it's very nice to see the data sitting exactly on uh, the theory. There are all kinds of other weird effects that we see with these clocks, like um, uh, a freezing of the periodicity of the interference pattern. This is just the Fourier transform of the, of the interference pattern. And if we change here, the distance between the two wave packets, like in the double slit experiment, we expect to see a uh, change in the periodicity uh, of the interference pattern, the periodicity of this interference pattern, and we see a freezing and jumps, and we're still investigating uh, this kind of uh, freezing. But now we get to the really interesting part, which is the full loop. This was already uh, 70 years ago, or maybe more, um, uh, suggested by people like Wigner and uh, Bohm. And they said, you know what, if you can do the half loop, close the interferometer have another, uh, um, it's really a time reversal operation. The second half is a time reversal operation of the first half. Have, if here we had two regions of permanent magnets, bring here two more regions of permanent magnets. So we split, we stop, we accelerate back and we stop again. We stop again to have full overlap in momentum and position. And uh, then you should see an interference pattern, not a special interference pattern, but interference pattern of the spin degree of freedom. And now the question was whether this could be done. This is much, much harder than the, than the half loop. Why? Because the half loop, the two wave packets simply uh, uh, expand until they overlap and they bring an interference, an interference pattern. You don't have to be accurate. Here, if you really want this to have an interference pattern here of the spin, you have to completely erase all previous switch path information. That means you have to erase the relative uh, motion. The relative momentum has to be zero. You have to have them fully overlap in position. And you also have to mix the spins. All these operations must be done here if you are to uh, see an interference pattern here. And this requires uh, very delicate and accurate magnetic operations. 
So this has to do with time irreversibility. Um, and I won't go into that. And we are not able to use the accuracy that people that use lasers, of course, they have the quantum accuracy of the photon recoil, H bar K. We do not have that. We're using classical magnets on the atom chip. So we have to be very, very active with our technology in order to be able to uh, come up with uh, um, this kind of accuracy. So um, let's look a little bit about what people said about the plausibility of this kind of interferometer. So people like uh, uh, Heisenberg, Wigner, Lamb, Bohm, Fermi, many people wrote about the impossibility uh, or the fact that this interferometer is going to be very hard to do uh, with macroscopic uh, magnets. Bohm wrote that it would require fantastic accuracy. Um, but really, quant uh, qual um, really calculating it and um, giving it some uh, quantitative analysis was done only in the 80s by um, uh, these three gentlemen here in a series of papers. Uh, they called the effect the Humpty Dumpty effect because you, once you broke it, you cannot put it back together again. And this is how they wanted to express their feeling that it's really, like Bohm said, requires fantastic accuracy and it's very, very hard to do. How hard? Well, exponentially hard. What the, the equation that they gave is that if this is the little deltas are the width of the wave packets in position and momentum, the big deltas are the accuracy with of your operations, uh, of your magnets, with which you have to put them together. If you're not on the same order, you're going to be exponentially, your coherence or your visibility is going to decay exponentially. Okay. And many papers were written about the connection between this Humpty Dumpty and, and, and time reversal or other ways to look at it. So now we go for the full loop. The half loop you already know. The full loop looks like that. So instead of two purple pulses of uh, magnetic gradient, you have now four magnetic gradient pulses. You have here an internal RF pulse that does the internal superposition. They split. They are entangled between momentum and spin the whole way. And here you have the last operation that puts them together in momentum and position. This is an overlap integral that cannot be, that will be zero if momentum and position are not uh, overlapping. And then we uh, use another pi half pulse actually closing a Ramsey sequence in order to uh, measure our spin signal. And this is what we expect. This is not data yet, okay? So this is what we expect. Uh, and indeed, just like in the uh, spatial interference fringe, we see a very high um, visibility also of the spin, uh, very high contrast also of the spin oscillations. Okay, so that's very nice. But now what can you do with it? Uh, well, uh, an idea came actually from Ulm. Uh, they came to us and said, well, you know, Ron, there was a prediction from 1927. This, was, this prediction was by Kennard. And Kennard wrote this interesting paper saying that if you can uh, do a full loop and you apply continuous force on the wave packet, you're going to see something interesting. And that is a T to the power of three phase accumulation. Yeah. So this was the prediction. We published this uh, paper together with the Ulm group uh, last year. And... Uh, uh, the special thing about the T cubed is that if you look at the typical interferometers that are used, like the Ramsey, Bourdain, uh, Mach Zender, or Kasevich Chu, you see that they either go to T to the power of one or T to the power of two. And apparently here we could get a pure T to the power of three phase. Uh, the theory, uh, very nice theory was done by Matthias, by uh, Maxim, and of course the group had uh, Wolfgang uh, Schleich. And uh, they provided the theory. And when we put the data on the theory, we were really pleased to see that uh, without any free parameters, we could really uh, put the data on their uh, uh, theory. And that works very nice. Now, it's not the end of the game because now apparently uh, it seems that we can go to T to the power of N, not only to the power of three, but to higher powers. We just have to engineer uh, in complicated ways, the pulses, the magnetic gradient pulses that we're giving. So we're now working on this T to the power of uh, N. But this is also not the end of the story of this T to the power of three. In a paper that just came out of Oxford, 
uh, they're claiming uh, that uh, this uh, kind of t to the power of three phase um, is actually connected to um, um, a quantum version of the equivalence principle. And so again, connects or works at the interface of um, uh, quantum mechanics and um, general relativity, and which is very interesting, of course, for us. I talked about this interface already when I talked about the clock interferometry. So I won't go into the details of this uh, paper, uh, but in principle, uh, they uh, are talking about uh, a superposition uh, not only of, of uh, two wave packets, but a superposition of two uh, uh, space-time configurations. And uh, it, I think it's a very interesting uh, concept. Um, and now I would like to um, start concluding with an even harder experiment. So I'm already in, into my outlook. Uh, so I said as an outlook that we're upgrading the clock inframeter. I talked about these uh, new ideas concerning the T-cube, what can be done with them. Um, and now even deeper into the outlook uh, is this stern uh splitting uh, of macroscopic objects, or shall I say uh, mesoscopic objects, for example, uh, a nano diamond that has two, 10 to the six, 10 to the seven, maybe even 10 to the 10 atoms inside it. And we're going to do it with a single spin inside this diamond. That's at least the idea. Uh, this, uh, these gentlemen here uh, uh, proposed this already in 2016. That was the first of a series of proposals that came out. And the idea is very simple copy exactly what I showed you now in the full loop with a single atom, copy it exactly the same way with the nano diamond. So we use a single spin in the center of this nano diamond. And what you do see here is an RF pulse uh, or a microwave pul pulse, doesn't matter, uh, that uh, puts the spin in a superposition, internal superposition. Now apply a magnetic gradient. It will split the nano diamond into two trajectories, each one having entangled with its own spin. Then you remember this was our false pull, first magnetic gradient pulse. This is the second magnetic gradient pulse. Uh, um, a third is already accelerating them back. And then we need a fourth one to uh, recombine them and then uh, do a spin measurement. So we're not trying here, like some people are thinking about, uh, um, uh, of, of looking at a, a macroscopic objects giving us um, uh, special interference pattern. Yeah. So here we're not looking for a special uh, interference pattern. Uh, for example, there are beautiful experiments uh, from the group of Marcus Arn with very heavy molecule. He is now holding the, I think the world record with uh, um, a few thousand atoms. Uh, that's very, very impressive. And he looks at the special interference patterns. But we are uh, uh, thinking that uh, an interesting alternative for very heavy um, objects would be to look actually at the spin uh, uh, oscillations like I showed you before. So there'll be a single spin here and we would look at these oscillations. And of course, such an experiment uh, uh, can address uh, all kinds of, um, of theories. Uh, for of course, it could probe quantum foundations, um, uh, superposition of uh, very heavy objects. Uh, how long they survive. Uh, for example, their models of spontaneous uh, collapse, continuous spontaneous collapse of uh, these kind of objects. Um, we could think of measuring uh, gravity in a new way, uh, probe exotic physics of all kinds. Uh, for example, uh, our friend Penrose uh, has this uh, very interesting idea that different from diff other forces uh, where you would not expect interaction between two wave packets for example, of an ion that have a uh, charge, but gravity is different and he would expect some self-interaction between two wave packets, um, uh, some gravitational interaction. And so we could also prove such ex uh, probe, such exotic ideas um, with this kind of stern full loop uh, inframeter. And the ideas just continue coming. Uh, this is another interesting paper uh, this paper, actually, the first authors here are Sugato and uh, Anupam, uh, our hosts today. And in this paper, they actually suggest to make two full loops in parallel, one parallel to the other. And you have here one 
uh, nano diamond and here another nano diamond again with a single spin inside. Uh, they start here, of course, and they go down. They do a full loop, a full loop, and only here the the trajectories come close to each other. And if there is sufficient screening of all other interactions and sufficient distance and mass uh, for a gravitational interaction here, then this gravitational interaction might induce um, um, uh, correlation and uh, entanglement between the spin of this system and the spin of this system. And then by measuring the spins here, we could uh, look at uh, bell states and things of that uh, sort. So there are all kinds of ideas coming uh, forward. Uh, by the way, there's this uh, paper we're just about to put on the archive. It will be on the archive, I guess, in a week or two, uh, where we actually uh, give numbers as best we can. Based on our full loop with a single atom, uh, we give numbers for this idea of using a full loop for a nano diamond. And so hopefully this is a first feasibility study uh, of uh, what really can be done. So I think it's time to conclude. Um, I again send you back to this beautiful picture of the building that is still standing uh, from 100 years ago. Um, and um, I think that, I hope at least, I managed to convince you that the Sterngerg effect is far from completing its historical role. All the experiments I showed you today, including the clock interferometry, are based on the Sterngerg experiment. There's still a lot of undiscovered uh, territory, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, there's several kind, uh, kinds of different impacts uh, related to gravity that, and I showed you some of them, uh, that could come from the Stern-Gerlach uh, interferometer, the full loop Stern-Gerlach uh, interferometer. Uh, for those really interested, uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, we put a review uh, of the interferometry experiments in the last uh, decade, the Stern-Gerlach interferometry experiment. Uh, it's a detailed review. Uh, we just put it on the archive. It's actually, uh, going into a book in honor of Otto Stern. And uh, I'm very happy that a book uh, in honor of Otto Stern will get to have these uh, beautiful interferometry, uh, Stern Gerlach interferometry experiment. Uh, this uh, very detailed uh, review is thanks to the first author, Mark Kyle, who really made a, a, a big effort to put all of the data and experiments together uh, in one paper. Um, let me thank the real heroes uh, behind uh, this experiment. Uh, it started uh, uh, with Shimi, uh, and then the team was uh, um, uh, made with uh, Yair, uh, Yair Margalit, who's now with Ketterle in MIT, and uh, Chifan Tzu, who is now uh, at NIST. And now the team that is working on it is uh, Omer Amit and uh, Odubkovsky. And uh, I won't mention them by, may, uh, by name, but many theoreticians uh, um, that have been uh, working uh, closely with us, um, uh, either within our group or within the physics department of Ben Gurion or from outside. Uh, and I mentioned him, them here. Um, and uh, they really, it was great to work with all these theoreticians and um, get their uh, insight. So thank you very much. I thank you for your attention. So let us give uh, a clap, a round of clap to Ron and, and um, the floor is open for questions. So just unmute yourself and ask, or if you raise your hands, I can also see. Better sound. Yeah, Ron. Anyone wants to go ahead first? Can I ask a question? Just a simple question, Ron. Sure, sure. A, um, in your Stern-Gerlag experiment, now you uh, you have uh, this uh, level two showing the interference. How about the level one? Does it give any more information, or if you ca can you find some correlation between the two or something of that kind? So you're talking about the half loop. First of all, it's a great question. Question. Thank you. You have very sharp eyes. You noticed that we only use a, a, the state two, the internal state two, 
Yeah. Um, we have to have the same spin, otherwise it's orthogonal. It will not give us interference pattern. But uh, you're very accurate that the other pair of state one also makes an interference pattern, but it's outside hmm. the field of view. And if we actually move a little bit the camera, hmm. we're able to see both interference patterns at the same time. Okay. And we actually use the two interference patterns at the same time uh, for all kinds of tests yeah. uh, that we're making. But you're definitely correct that both pairs give an interference pattern after expansion. Right, okay. Right. Will there be any like, correlation between the two interference patterns uh, or can you use that, for instance, to show more strongly about the coherence? Well, the, for coherence, it's enough to uh, show the visibility in one interference pattern. Okay. Uh, but we definitely see nice visibility in both interference patterns. Okay. And, um, but you can use correlation between these two interference patterns uh, uh, for all kinds of more complex tests uh, um, but I, I would not like to go into that. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone? Anyone else? There is a question. I don't know whether it's a question from the chat, but there, there is something written in uh, in uh, Hebrew, I, I guess, in the chat. Uh, in Hebrew? Uh-huh. I, I, I don't know whether it's a question. Um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, tell you what it says. Um, well... Uh, it says, uh, well done. Okay, 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 I see, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I had a bit of question regarding the, the atom atom chip. Uh, so uh, thinking that if, if these kind of experiment that we have proposed, if one also wants to do them near an atom chip. Um, so already with atoms, you probably see some kind of near uh, atom chip uh, interactions, right? When the atom is near the chip uh, with say microns for these gradients. You mean interactions with the surface? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, things being near. Yes, well, yeah, yes, you do. You do see um, uh, interactions with the surface, but they are, uh, I would say, standard uh, interactions. For example, we see spin flips due to Johnson noise that comes from the metallic surface, or we see um, uh, there were beautiful papers, for example, by Eric Cornell. Uh, measuring the Casimir uh, polder force uh, coming from the surface. So people have definitely um, um, uh, measured the surface and feel the surface. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have actually uh, had to take down the amount of metal in the surface in our wires. Ah. It's very funny, but you have to be stingy with the amount of metal you put in your wires because the more metal you put, the more Johnson noise you, got, you get. And, um, and you feel it immediately on the atoms. So you have to have a lot of uh, kind of magic, material engineering of the atom chip to really be able to come very close. By the way, uh, our, our, our smallest distance uh, in, um, um, maybe it's the world record, I don't know, but our smaller, uh, the smallest distance in our lab uh, so far was five micrometer for, uh, to see spatial, uh, uh, spatial coherence. In an right, right, right. And uh, another question, just from the you know the first half loop, uh, so uh, very similar to uh, in the setting that Myungshik was asking. Um, so I, I just wonder. So you said that there's not too much control that you need to see that interference pattern, but I guess you need some uh, like the the source cannot. Uh, so of course you did with some thermal source as well, but this is not clear to me. So if the if the source is shifting, then the pattern will be washed out, right? And uh, so is there some kind of control you still need? Sure. Yeah. You 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 of course need uh, um, some uh, minimal uh, control, otherwise. Um... Um, uh, you would not see anything. Uh, but uh, the point is that uh, the full loop uh, uh, needs much better control uh, than the half loop. Um, there's something very interesting in spatial interference fringes, which people uh, uh, might um, um, uh, take advantage in the future. Mm. Uh, uh, several papers, theory papers, uh, have already been written about it. Uh, some call it actually um, coherence inflation. I think there was a very nice uh, um, uh, term coined. Uh, so when you do special interference patterns, you only care about uh, the local uh, coherence length and the local coherence length, it keeps growing 
because of purification on a, on a unit scale, a purification of, um, uh, of the momentum spread. There's more and more purification of the momentum spread. And so uh, it actually um, uh, gives you more and more co local coherence length. Uh, and so with special interference fringes, there's some magic happening, which makes it very easy, very easy. Whereas with a full loop, you, you have to calculate something called the overlap integral. You don't need to do that in the half loop. With a full loop, you um, calculate uh, the overlap integral and it's very tough on you. This is this exponential decay that I talked about that tells you that if you're not very accurate uh, and you have to be better than the original coherence length on the, or the width, the original width of the wave packet, uh, if you want to see any kind of coherence or visibility. So it's a much harder task, mm. uh, but uh, we still believe that this is what should be done for macroscopic objects uh, because we think that uh, seeing a spatial interference pattern uh, with macroscopic objects is going to be hard for various reasons. And therefore, although ha the half loop is easier with a single atom, uh, we think the full loop will be easier with uh, macroscopic objects. But of course, the proof is in the pudding, the British say, and uh, we have to see what the experiments will tell us. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, any other? Yeah, please. So would that mean that uh, your, uh, you, one would require a very strong um, you know, constraint on the current? So the current has to be, you know, your, your current has to be very, very precise so that you can minimize any of this, uh, you know. It's a great question. What, what would make the operations very, very accurate? And uh, our, our currents are actually electromagnets. We're of course not using permanent magnets because we need control in time. Uh, and uh, uh, we're working hard on understanding what would make a very accurate electromagnet. Uh, of course, the first thing you think about is the noise in the current. Uh, usually current drivers, the best you can buy in the market are orders of magnitude above shot noise. And we're working hard on electronics to go down to shot noise and even below shot noise. Some people, including NASA, by the way, are working on technology that would take currents even below shot noise, what you would call squeezed currents. So there are all kinds of ideas on how to make these electromagnets uh, more and more accurate. Thanks, thanks. Is superconductor is a good idea then? Uh, superconducting current? Uh, uh, superconductors uh, are a um, fascinating idea. Uh, some groups, atom chip groups, already use superconducting uh, chips. Uh, they have uh, advantages, but they also have disadvantages. For example, I think that eventually we'll be able to push much more current density through normal wires, then through superconductors. And when I say normal wires, it's not normal gold wires, but normal state, not superconducting state wires with all kinds of crazy chemistry inside that would allow us a high current density. But I think that eventually we will be able to push much higher current density in these kind of room temperature wires, uh, but with special chemistry uh, rather than uh, superconducting wires. And that would, of course, give us much more splitting in a much shorter time. By the way, I didn't mention it, but the, the, one of the, deep, uh, the, the hindering effects of these macroscopic experiments is, of course, very fast decoherence rate. The cross-section, for example, uh, for collision with a background gas is huge. You have to do everything very quickly. And this is a very big advantage of our full loop stern because we in our atom chip, because we can make the full experiment extremely quickly, you know? Microsecond time scales, we're finished with the infrometer. And so um, if, even if the decoherence rate is high and we expect it to be high, even coming from black body radiation, um, uh, you really want to finish this uh, quickly. So you want very strong magnetic gradients to be able to split and bring back extremely quickly. And for that, you need high, high current density. Thank you.
So can I just ask how how big is the gradient near the surface of your chip? How large magnetic gradients can you uh, get before getting in trouble? Well, uh, trouble for us means, um, I don't know, that the, the, the wire burns. <laughs> That's the first trouble we'll probably encounter. Um, and I have to tell you that uh, we already burnt a few chips. It's a spectacular supernova in the chamber. Um, so it's really, a, a, there's a question of, a, of a, a lot of material engineering has to go into it. Um, but I gave a number before. Uh, for example, with a very moderate current of two amps and uh, 10 micrometer, you already get to 40 kilogauss per millimeter. Um, so in one of the slides, I gave that number. Uh, but these are not final numbers. You can push more. Uh, two amps is a regular current for gold, but some, uh, some materials will probably be enable a current density even two orders of magnitude higher than that. How quickly, sorry, how quickly you can switch on and off this kind of current? So, so as I mentioned, there's no inductance. So uh, switching off on and off is really not limited by anything. Uh, right now uh, we're doing it in a microsecond, but we see no reason why not to go to a nanosecond. Right. Uh, and, and so you, you're really not limited. Okay, thank you. So any, any more questions for Ron? Um, otherwise, maybe we can, we can uh, stop the recording, but some people who want to stay can still stay for longer and maybe ask, I mean, it depends on how much time, or, I mean, it, it is one more hour in Ron's place. So, uh, or, or, so, so anyway, uh, yeah, we can, we can probably uh, relax and ask a few more questions if, if Ron is happy to stay. When the corona is over, people are definitely uh, welcome to come and visit. We like getting visits um, and do some brainstorming <laughs> together. Um, and so uh, please come. And um, anyway, if you have some nice uh, ideas and you want to discuss them or questions, you can always email me, no problem. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, so maybe we, yeah. We, um, we, uh, yeah. we we stop for today, but but yeah, if you want to. Um...